we're going to use going forward, which is uh, to have a brief update from our colleagues at the Western Cape Department of Health regarding the surveillance of COVID-19 in the Western Cape. Uh, and that's followed by our, our main talk. Um, and then we go over to a panel discussion where we invite um, three or four panelists to engage with the speaker, ask questions and make comments on the topic. Um, so without further ado, I'd, I'd just like to welcome Andrew Bull um, from the School of Public Health at UCT and the Western Cape Department of Health, uh, who's going to give us a brief update on the surveillance for COVID-19 in the Western Cape. So over to you, Andrew. Uh, thank, thank you, Graham, and, and greetings to everyone. Um, so, uh, as Graham mentioned, we've been asked every week to just give a brief update, and we'll try and keep it keep it very brief. Um, the if I can have the next slide, I don't know if I don't have controls. Uh, Mark, if you could advance. Okay, there we go. Um, and a few clicks further. One click further in. So um, many of you will, okay, one back. Uh, many of you will remember that when Professor Slim Karim presented to the country about the waves of the epidemic, um, they talked about the blue uh, imported cases, the local transmissions from the imported cases, and then the community transmission. And 10 days ago, our provincial government uh, asserted that community transmission was established based on the graph in the middle. And the the high peak in that graph I've shown where it is on the current graph to show subsequent to that in the last 10 days how many cases there have been that have been uh, coming through. Um, the dates re uh, reflecting are the dates in which the diagnosis, the tests were taken. So they, they always look a few days behind when they were actually entered. And today, um, today the um, team doing the outbreak response registered 200 cases, just to give you a sense of how complex the outbreak uh, contact tracing approach has become because of the, the volume. Next slide. And, and as Graham mentioned, uh, the uh, distribution is now very uh, generalized. So this is not necessarily entirely accurate. We auto automatically geocode addresses and not all of them geocode um, with the fidelity we would like but it does give a sense of how uh, widespread the cases are. Not necessarily because they all have come from community transmission in the areas where they reflect, but some of the clustered transmissions that are happening in uh, essential services, retail, the people who, in whom those have, hap have happened are themselves distributed very widely in terms of their residential locations and these. This represents uh, res residential locations, but there are also very um, clear uh, patterns of uh, community transmission that's happening uh, uh, lo locally as well. In terms of laboratory testing, uh, when we started, the majority of the testing was happening uh, in the private sector and the NHLS has really ramped up quite dramatically. Uh, represented by the green um, and the dark green represents tests that are coming through to us with the locality of community screening and testing. So we're trying to distinguish those tests that are done as part of a, a community screening initiative. The Western Cape community screening initiatives are quite targeted around areas where we're seeing cases and we are registering, if you look on the bottom graph here, um, uh, over 5% of cases now from community screening that are positive, which is more than double what the national estimate is for community screening. And uh, they can be interpreted two ways, that we have a more established epidemic in the Western Cape, which we do, but also that we are more targeted in the national uh, DDG. Dr. Pillay has commented that he, he feels that part of the reasons for the difference is the, is the more targeted approach to the screening in the, in the province. Um, and you can see that generally the, the um, moving average of the, of the percentage of tests that are positive has been creeping up towards 10% in, the, in uh, all, all laboratory testing. And the total number of uh, people screened and uh, referred for testing from the community screening is reflected on the slide. Uh, 
Um, in terms of the clinical outcomes, so we've had uh, 220 admissions that we've recorded across public and private sector. Um, and uh, of those, uh, 48 have been admitted to, um, to ICUs, also across both public and private sector. To, to give us, and, and um, the, in fact, this number of deaths, uh, it's sitting at 44 deaths that we know about at the moment. And the reason why there's a bit of discrepancy is that some of the deaths we hear about have happened mm -hmm. out of hospital or post-discharge from hospital. So not all of them are reflected in the admitted cases. And you'll see that the, um, the overall mortality of everyone admitted is, is uh, uh, sitting at around a quarter. And this is, just those, this is looking just at those admissions that have a discharge or an outcome. So it's not all admissions so far. Um, and uh, ranging from 12% in those who went to general wards to 43% um, uh, in patients who ended up in an ICU. Higher mortality in the public sector ICUs than the private sector ICUs. And currently, the proportion of all patients admitted to hospital that are in the private sector that we know about are 40% and a higher percentage, 53%, for those who are admitted in, um, uh, to ICU is being admitted in private. And you can see that the, um, the lengths of stays are not, um, they're, they're creeping up for some of the ICU patients. And we would expect that the early discharges would disproportionately reflect shorter admissions. Um, but we are seeing lengths of stay um, creeping toward uh, above 10 days in the, pub, in the private sector and median about eight days in the public sector. And this is something we're watching closely because a lot of the bed utilization expectations are, are, are based on that. And the green line at the bottom left is the age distribution of the patients who've been admitted and the black line, uh, the, the patients who've died. And that's on the background of, a, of, a, of an age distribution that is, that is uh, much younger. And so not unsurprisingly, older patients are, 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 are being admitted and dying. And in, in this age group here of uh, 40 to 60, um, there's five, five patients out of the 30 that we reviewed a few days ago who, um, uh, who had died uh, with a known diagnosis of HIV. Um, four of the five had very uh, well-established comorbidities or um, lack of virologic suppression. Um, but it is, a, it is something that we're watching closely and we will at one of these meetings try and do a more thorough analysis of all admissions and, and deaths um, in relation to HIV and TB. And uh, just in terms of, of uh, information access, this, uh, this is a dashboard that should go live sometime this week that the, um, the Premier will launch that will give us a little bit more granularity to what's in the public domain. And, and hopefully we will also be able to get out some, some more uh, granular data um, as, uh, <coughs> um, in the week or two following this. And I think that's, that was my last slide. Thank you very much. Is the, is, is the uh, culturing in the community um, based on symptoms? So in the um, uh, general uh, testing it is, but in the areas where there's been a uh, cluster, uh, such as in occupational settings and healthcare settings and essential services, they've tended to test everybody, even if they haven't had symptoms. and uh, my colleagues can can reflect, but the the experience from that has been there's a very large number of asymptomatic patients who test positive when they've done the more expensive testing. Okay, so thanks very much, Andrew, for that uh, presentation. Again, it's fantastic to have these updates and, and see on a weekly basis um, how the epidemic is evolving and and giving us a much better understanding of what's going on and and how the systems that you have for tracking the epidemic are, are also, um, you know, constantly developing and giving us a greater insights. So to move on to our, our main talk, um, as you're all aware, the, the world is facing a, a protracted struggle against COVID-19, uh, with countries trying to find a balance between lockdowns uh, that stagnate our economies uh, and surges of the, the epidemic that threaten to overwhelm 
our health systems and result in substantial mortality. And our only assured route out of this, this desperate scenario uh, is the discovery of, uh, and global rollout of, of an effective treatment uh, or vaccine. And to discuss the, the pathway towards an effective vaccine uh, and the challenges that, that are anticipated, it's a great honor to welcome Professor Larry Corrie. Uh, Larry is the principal investigator and he has been the principal investigator since its inception in 1999 of the HVTN or the HIV Vaccine Trials Network of the US uh, National Institutes of Health. And he's a professor of medicine and laboratory medicine at the University of Washington. And Larry has been at the forefront of HIV science uh, since the 1980s. He's contributed uh, to many of the major breakthroughs in HIV prevention and treatment, and is, is widely regarded for his role in the scientific leadership in, in the HIV field. Uh, Larry's attention has now and that of the HVTN has now turned uh, towards tackling the challenge of discovering um, and then evaluating uh, candidates for a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. So Larry, welcome, and uh, we're really looking forward to hearing your talk this afternoon. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> well, why don't we just get into it then? Uh, thank you very much to be able to do this. <clears throat> Uh, let me see if I can move the slides, even with the delay. Um, <coughs> no, uh, oh, there we go. <coughs> I thought I'd uh, start with um, uh, <coughs> the uh, really the, the issue of the epidemiology of this and the <clears throat> sort of extraordinary timeline that um, we have been faced with worldwide. Um, uh, there is a, this delay, so um, that is gonna slow me down here. <clears throat> uh, okay. So this is sort of well known to all of us, I think, but um, the first case in uh, uh, the 17th of December, the first cluster um, uh, in the Wuhan seafood market, the isolation of the virus on the 7th of January, the sequence published on the 10th of January, um, really PCR diagnostic tests developed and distributed at, at record time. <clears throat> we in our country had a problem with regulations and labs that academic labs that design PCRs that weren't allowed to use them, which was um, unfortunate in, in our situation. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the outbreak has gone, you know, at, at, you know, at an enormous doubling time, sort of much greater doubling time than sort of any infectious disease. And how do you develop new therapies and new concepts uh, in, in such a time? And, and that's been, you know, one of the issues, uh, I think, finally, it's not like the scientists were not um, uh, attuned to trying to do this, but the biomedical establishment to actually bring products um, and, and new concepts uh, into existence is finally uh, happening. Um, <clears throat> I am trying to uh, get through this delay a bit here and anticipating this. So um, coronaviruses are zoonotic diseases. Um, uh, there's an enormous number of coronaviruses uh, that have been isolated from bats. Um, they are asymptomatic in bats, uh, probably related to some um, uh, innate resistance genes, which um, you know do not um, that that allow uh, the virus and the host to coexist. Um, it looks like it, it's not identical to a bat virus, so there's an epizootic transmission. Um, the possible candidate is this pangolin. Um, uh, and the slaughtering of those animals and the trafficking of those animals um, throughout the world. Um, this is a screenshot from the Johns Hopkins site, pretty similar to what you guys are developing, but uh, on a global pattern, we've now passed 3 million. Um, so to have 3 million infections be globally in a, um, from a, in a virus in a four month period of time is pretty astounding. Um, there have been over 210,000 deaths. Um, uh, unfortunately, the United States is uh, now at uh, pretty close to 60,000 of those deaths, and 
um, <clears throat> is on a total case basis, leading the world in that situation. Um, and uh, here, and one of the interesting issues of the transmission, this is data from our own labs in uh, Seattle, the virology labs, where we have developed in-house PCRs for you know 20 years for the diagnosis of respiratory disease. And um, uh, what I wanted to do here is just, just looking at what we call the CT values, which is sort of indirectly and actually directly related to um, the quantity of virus. Um, and, and this is sort of nasal swabs, nasal pharyngeal swabs. On the top graph, right. from over 3,000 positive SARS-CoV-2 um, and about 519 influenza A samples. The influenza A samples are the last two or three years. There's no difference. But the point I wanted to show here is, um, is that there's about 20% of the SARS-CoV-2 um, samples that are really very high titered. We're really talking about CT values that are a log to a log and a half higher than influenza virus uh, values. And I think that this, these clusters and super shedders and, um, you know, really are, um, uh, you know, I think probably come from these people who are excreting at very high titers. I mean, this is, uh, this to us, we've never seen these kinds of titers out of respiratory virus. They're 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 7th, and we quantitate them. And there's a significant amount of this. So the receptor density for the ACU, the viral receptor in the nasal epithelium is very high. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons we see such high rates of transmission and whether acquisition rates are associated with severity rates uh, is really unclear. But this um, uh, formidable pathogen in the early parts of, uh, uh, of infection uh, where very high titers are seen. And in our situation, I think it's higher than influenza. Um, so uh, I think that's a point I wanted to make. Um, <clears throat> deaths are um, uh, sort of, this is a um, daily new confirmed deaths per million, a sort of a rolling seven day average that, that has been looked at. Um, many countries have been peaking. The United States uh, is still rising uh, on this one as we have distribution of, um, uh, of this epidemic from our coastal communities um, uh, to uh, throughout the country. Um, so, um, this one didn't have South Africa on it yet, but um, uh, it's just a snapshot of a, uh, of a website that, that is occurring. So again, um, very enormous death rates. I'm trying to change the slide here again. Uh, in the United States, um, uh, we essentially have a pan-United States epidemic. It's certainly been uh, coastal. Um, it's starting to... Um, uh, it's starting to decrease in Washington. It's maybe hitting its, um, you know, plateau uh, in the East Coast. It's uh, extensively starting in the um, in the Midwest of the country, and this is about a week old. Um, so just to give you a sense that, you know, it has spread throughout all our uh, all our country, and you know, density is the fuel of the virus and the enemy of um, of the human and um, density certainly is an issue. And these micro epidemics that we are see seeing in industrial plants, poultry plants, meat packing plants, grocery stores, um, I think will continue to percolate um, throughout. Um, and I'm sort of trying to see if the next slide. Um, <clears throat> there is empirical evidence that physical distancing works and, and it, these two graphs show the exponential so if you get it in the exponential phase, how you can blunt the curve versus what happens if uh, it permeates and you have simultaneous micro outbreaks. Um, these are two adjacent Italian provinces in Lombardy. Uh, Lodi on the left began shelter in place on the 26th of February. Uh, the other, uh, Bergano began 10 days later. Um, and look at the difference between the left and the right um, as far as uh, permeation of um, uh, of uh, the epidemics in these two areas. <clears throat> so let's, let's go from the epidemiology to the virus. Um, um, there are um, two groups of coronaviruses. Um, uh, I don't know if this will show, the, let's say the top left panel 
There are four non-SARS-like human coronaviruses. Actually, um, one of them, I think, uh, human coronavirus NL63, which actually uses the same receptor, I think was actually described uh, by a group from UCT uh, a few years ago. Um, these um, human coronaviruses were very funny names. I can never even remember them. Um, the four are generally cause mild respiratory disease, um, both naturally and an experimental challenge. Um, they rarely cause lung disease in immunocompromised, uh, uh, and, and if they do, it's in immunocompromised persons, and it's really not a very common pathogen, um, even in bone marrow transplant patients. Um, <clears throat> the seasonal activity is winter and early spring. They tend to recur in two to four year cycles, which suggests natural infection is not long-term protective, um, that they're really a respiratory um, infection, except for NL63, they use a different receptor, um, and they're seasonal and very mild. Um, this kind of seasonal persistence has been a, a worry for SARS-CoV-2, although I, I do think that all the SARS agents are really very different pathophysiologically, and, and frankly, um, I'm not sure what will happen long term, but uh, I think there's a, a different pathogenesis, and I think we'll see a different immune response. Infection potentially in, in CoV-1. What makes the SARS coronaviruses much more severe than other human coronaviruses is that the virus invades the deep tissues of the human body, lung, heart, and GI tract. I think in a lot of people there probably is a uh, is an early, uh, is a viremia. Some people sort of think about it as as um, uh, direct extension. Uh, the illness essentially, essentially has two phases. The first phase, the virus lands on the nasal epithelium. Lung tissue replicates in these tissues. Uh, one of the interesting clinical manifestations is loss of smell and, and taste, and they're, they're related to the same receptor. Um, uh, Linda Buck at our institution, who you know, got a Nobel Prize for um, look, working out the, you know, how we smell, um, really feels that it's the intense inflammatory response in the nasal mucosa that is actually interrupting the, neuronals, the, the neuronal ability to sense and smell, um, mainly smell, and therefore you lose your sense of taste. Um, <clears throat> but again, I think makes the point that it's different than any other respiratory illness. I don't think I've ever seen a respiratory illness that has this kind of clinical manifestation associated with it. Um, the host immune response, um, uh, especially as it lands in the lung and the receptor is in the lung and you get lung disease normatively. Um, Chinese actually use CT scans as a screening tool um, because of the high incidence of bilateral ground glass pneumonia. Um, and that leads to a immunopathological um, process, a, a storm of immunological hormones that we call chemokines and cytokines. Um, actually, some of these are immunosuppressive, IL-10, IL-4. Uh, you don't see uh, in severe cases very many um, CD8 T, uh, T cells. You see an enormous number of activated CD4 cells. Um, so there's sort of an aberrant immune response and why that's occurring and uh, how's that happening? Why is it seen more in the elderly than, than in the young? You experimental animals with SARS-1, uh, you older macaques uh, get more severe disease than younger macaques, um, and uh, there is some feeling that maybe this is related to um, an early aberrancy in the, um, uh, in the innate immune responses. Um, this is an area that, that really needs to be clarified. Um, but this is a disease that is very different than the other human coronaviruses. I think the biphasic systemic illness suggests much greater priming of immunological memory and hence greater protective immunity. Some studies that are being done now that are not yet pu published, but um, Jeffy Panaleo did a webinar in, in, from Lausanne, uh, as I'm doing from Seattle to you, and has really shown an enormous number of plasma blasts and activated CD4 cells in people who are, uh, with, uh, who are hospitalized with uh, COVID-19. Um, uh, I also am optimistic that you will have lasting memory. Um, monoclonal antibodies from SARS-CoV-1 have been fished out 10 years post-SARS, saying there's good memory persists long-term. Um, uh, yet, really, for SARS-CoV-2, we do not know what the long-term protection is. 
uh, whether asymptomatic infection gives you protection. And you know, uh, all these kind of long-term cohorts, uh, if they could be followed uh, epidemiologically for reinfection or lack of reinfection, um, lack of transmission will, will help the field. And the kind of epidemiology that you guys are doing, uh, I think um, could help very, very much in that area. Um, but it all indicates actually for vaccine development that um, we need durability um, uh, as part of the issue of um, how we do vaccine trials. Um, we're waiting for the next slide here. Um, <clears throat> contact tracing is nice, but I think biomedical interventions are needed to help get us out of this mess. Um, <clears throat> uh, antivirals, small molecules, um, monoclonal antibodies. It, it looks like the, interestingly, the technology for monoclonal antibodies seems to be faster now than antivirals. And um, I think monoclonals are starting to emerge in the late, uh, what I'll call our summer, your winter, um, for testing. And there are a number of companies that are bringing forth monoclonals to the, uh, to the receptor, and I, I think will be available uh, for therapy as well as prevention. Um, uh, convalescent plasma has been talked about. Um, I'm not aware of any controlled trials. We're hoping that we can do some controlled trials. Um, uh, there's a hyperimmune IgG that's being made also. Um, uh, and there are a lot of drugs to reduce cytokine storm. Uh, it's a complex issue whether any single drug uh, of anti-IL whatever, certainly IL-6 has had, you know, multiple, small, multiple studies, some positive, some negative. As far as prevention of disease um, and hospitalization, uh, vaccines and monoclonals are uh, what we have been talking about. So I, my, my talk is really going to... Um, look at vaccine development and it starts with um, what's the target antigen for a vaccine. Uh, and in general, um, when we think about a target antigen, um, we think about uh, trying to go after uh, the receptor of the virus and how do, how do you prevent attachment. Um, and uh, again, come, oops. Um, and the, 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 the virus itself, um, this is uh, from the New York Times, bad news wrapped in a protein. Um, it has these uh, spikes on the outside of it. It has a single, uh, very long gene. Um, uh, the yellow protein is the ORF1 and is eventually split by two scissor proteins into 16, 16 proteins. The, the virus in itself has uh, 23 proteins. So HIV has 15, a herpes virus has 150. So um, there is a complexity to the virus. Um, but its landing gear, um, its spike, its red, is um, where most of the attention and in fact all the attention in, in the preventive eye, uh, field is, is associated with. And um, uh, this is more of a graph that you see at least in US television. It's the depiction of the virus um, done by the graphic designers of the CDC. You can actually see that the spike protein is in a trimer, uh, similar to what you see in, in, in HIV. Um, there's a lot more trimers on the outer of the vi virus. They um, come together and they call it, uh, look like a crown, uh, and that's where the coronavirus um, you know, name comes from. Um, <clears throat> the, the spike protein is the landing gear. And frankly, Virology 101, if a virus can't land, it can't get into the cell. Its tropism is very much associated with, with its receptor. You see the ACE2 receptor not only in the nasal epithelium, you see it in the lung. Um, you also see it in the heart. You can see it in the GI tract. Um, uh, and if you look at those uh, areas, that's where the tropism of the virus is. So really knowing where it lands and how to block landing um, is essentially um, uh, for attacking the agent. So um, this yellow thing is, um, is, uh, is what the ACE2 uh, receptor looks like. Uh, it's very high in the nasal epithelium, as I showed you, um, and the disease is multi-organ because the receptor is distributed widely in the body. Um, and the spike protein attaches to that receptor, and that's uh, you know, what we do. Now, <clears throat> Developing a vaccine is not always simple. There are a couple of theoretical concerns for COVID-19 vaccines. One of them everybody here should be familiar with is the antigenic drift that occurs with HIV. 
Um, this virus doesn't seem, you know, has a little bit of antigenic drift, and I'll just show you a, um, a couple graphs. Uh, so far, that antigenic drift doesn't look like it's affecting what we call the receptor binding site very much, although there are being increasingly some mutations in that area, but um, <clears throat> whether they're gonna be functionally important or not remains to be seen. Um, and then there's this area uh, that we'll talk about called uh, immune enhancement. Um, <clears throat> this is a genetic map from um, Trevor Bedford's site at the Hutch um, that he you know, tracks the, the genetic isolation of the virus. Uh, um, over here on the right hand side in the sort of darkish green is the S or the spike protein. Um, and uh, the top graph is what the what it looked like on March 30th and approximately a month later in April 24th. So you see, um, you know, a few different, uh, the, the access, the, the length of these bars is the, is the percent of strains that have that mutation or have a mutation at that site from the original Wuhan virus. Um, uh, you can see in the spike that it's been that there is a couple of mutations, but they're relatively um, similar. And if you look at this graph, it's you know yes, you can see some some mutational uh, change, but it's not a kind of graph that we actually see in HIV. So um, yes, it's a theoretical concern, but um, uh, there seems to be for three million people over um, the, there's there is uh, yes, there is change like there is an RNA virus. Um, but there's also a greater stability than we've seen in, um, uh, in, in HIV, and we're hoping the vaccine antigens that we design now uh, will still be effective a year from now. I mean, enhancement has been described in coronavirus um, <clears throat> uh, itself, and in experiment, and in, in not human coronavirus vaccines, but in animal coronavirus vaccines. Um, <clears throat> first of all, animal data from SARS-CoV-1. Uh, with a variety of different vaccines, generally inactivated vaccines, but occasionally in a vector-based vaccine, one of them in particular, an MVA vector vaccine, has shown vaccine-induced enhancement can occur in animal models. <clears throat> and feline coronaviruses um, uh, itself has an, animal, uh, has an immune enhancement path aspect to the disease. <clears throat> The prevailing theory of, of, of vaccine-enhanced respiratory disease, which is the kind of thing that one saw with respiratory syncytial virus um, vaccination of infants in the 1960s, seen um, you know, in almost 80% of the kids who got this inactivated vaccine that now we know gave um, neutralization and binding antibodies, but didn't affect attachment and then led to this enhanced uh, immune response. And this enhancement immune response has been seen again with immune complex disease and what has been naively called a TH2 based immune response. Um, so there, we don't know if this is gonna be a problem with SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, but most regulatory agencies are wanting an animal model um, work um, that sort of shows um, that doesn't that that doesn't show immune enhancement, and would prefer not to have um, an, a using a use of an adjuvant or an immune response that um, that is associated with um, uh, production of IL-4, IL-10 kinds of responses. It is also, <clears throat> uh, at least in the U.S., we don't think an activated vaccines is um, traditional. Lactone um, and activated vaccines is necessarily a way to go. Um, and in our first line view of, of, of vaccines, don't, don't think, feel more modern approaches um, uh, should and, and be used um, for this issue of immune enhancement. So let's, so um, the target is to go after the, um, uh, the uh, spike protein. What do you do next? Um, um, protection in preclinical animal studies, whether that's a hamster, whether that's a ferret, whether that's a non-human primate. Um, both the rhesus macaque and more recently the African green monkey uh, have been shown to be susceptible. Whether they're really good uh, models or not, they are at least infection models that you can look at blocking. Is there a target neutralizing antibody titer associated with protection? Um, again, this, this disease, even though we now have 3 million cases, uh, they've occurred in a short period of time and to muster the um, the, the data to develop standardized assays. But one of the questions in the field is, you know, 
what level of neutralization do you get post-infection? And if you believe sort of maybe like I do that, you know, um, you would probably get protection. Um, <clears throat> one of the questions that we've been asking is, is there anybody with SARS-1 who, you know, are they protected against SARS-2 and against COVID-2? Um, <clears throat> the geographic distributions of the two epidemics are um, just beginning to be looked at. It's certainly in Asia, but there's no data on that. So is there a, what is the sort of the, the bell-shaped curve of neutralizing antibody titers associated with protection? Um, and do phase one immunogenicity and safety studies reach such a target? Um, the HVTN, at least in the United States, uh, put into a, um, in the field, uh, will be next week, uh, what we call HVTN 405, which is uh, HVTN uh, I don't know, 1091 or something um, <clears throat> that is uh, designed to evaluate this. Um, I am told uh, by Glenda Gray that uh, you guys have a fair number of those studies going on now in your country. And I think um, looking at the spectrum of um, what is the neutralizing antibodies uh, spectrum in com people who uh, convalesce uh, from COVID-19 uh, COVID uh, is would be very helpful. So what, what's a target neutralization? When you look at the WHO list of COVID vaccine candidates, um, you see 73, um, and they cover the spectrum from non-replicating viral vectors to DNA to inactivated vaccines to RNA vaccines, a live attenuated vaccine, protein, lots of protein subunit vaccine, vaccines, replicating vectors um, and viral um, uh, uh, VLPs. Um, so the uh, real question actually you to ask yourself is, you know, if you have 73, that's great diversity, but um, how do you win all those um, down? And uh, we get to the next slide, we'd like to talk about our strategy for that. <clears throat> I think you in this one, um, whereas you can say any idea is a good idea, um, I think you have to look at it as the platform likely to succeed. Does one reduce the risk of potential immune enhancement? Um, is the platform scalable from a manufacturing point of view? Um, we have a formidable task here, and if it takes 10 years to develop a vaccine, we have to really look at that. Is the company and organization developing the vaccine experienced and resourced enough to be able to manufacture it immediately? And are they willing to make it available for all uh, countries, including low and middle income countries? And I think that's the way we approach it. Uh, conceptual framework for COVID-19 vaccine development. And I think there's a framework that we've worked out with John Muscola, Mike Cohn, frankly, Tony and Francis Collins, uh, Tony Fauci and Tony Francis Collins is, is the reality that we need to develop multiple vaccine platforms. There is no single vaccine platform that can be manufactured at enough scale to immunize the 4.4 billion adult populations on the planet. In the United States, we need 220 million adults in the US alone. So if we're gonna travel, we're gonna get back to normal in a, in a, in a year from now, there is no one vaccine. We have to, we have to um, hope and create success for multiple vaccines because we need to manufacture multiple vaccines. We can't, don't have the ability to manufacture just one type of vaccine. I'll go through it. Uh, the RNA has the LMPs. There's not enough lipid uh, LMPs in the world to, to make 4 billion doses. Um, um, so we need to use platforms to cover the field scientifically, and we need to use pl different platforms to manufacture because scalability is a key factor. And we need to coordinate this to, to involve global manufacturing companies, and there must be an unprecedented and coordinated effort to test, manufacture the vaccine and scale, and deliver the vaccine into people's arms throughout the world. We can't do what's happened with HPV or HPV, where it's taken 10 years in order to go anywhere. So how do we organize ourselves to do this? Um, we need a global effort, global cooperation and transparency are needed to maximize the speed, the veracity, the decision-making required to deliver scientific advances to the global population in a timely fashion. I think that manufacturers just can't do it themselves and say, hey, we believe our data and our data says one thing and another manufacturer says another. We have got to be able to share specimens, share, um, we think um, DSMBs and a bunch of other issues in order to 
make the decisions of not just whether a vaccine works, but what is the effort that goes into manufacturing it? Um, what philanthropic organizations, government organizations, and private organizations that are going to be done to manufacture um, what needs to be done. So <clears throat> the idea um, that we have is, is you know, people in the, uh, uh, in, I was going to say in this room, but out there in the Zoom uh, audience um, uh, should be familiarize it because it's the kind of public-private partnerships that we've done for the 702 trial and the 705 trial. Um, we sort of view that uh, uh, <clears throat> that there should be harmonized efficacy trials. We're realistic. We don't think everybody uh, can do the same trial. We don't think it's going to happen in the same timing that you can use the same placebo group. Um, I'll call, call it platform one, platform two, platform three, four, and five. I'll go through what um, our, I think the US government's um, selections, but we want them to use um, harmonized licensure efficacy trials. So basically the same kind of endpoints. Um, we would like them to co use collaborating clinical trials networks, not identical, but um, be nice to have some overlap. Probably one of the more important things is collaborating labs. Um, we need an assay that defines infection from disease. It looks like that's gonna be uh, possible, mainly through the use of um, antibodies to the nucleoprotein, which occur with natural infection. Um, uh, early data would suggest uh, almost 100%. Uh, um, data needs to be looked at to make sure it's uh, the, this, the nucleoprotein here is um, different from human coronavirus, um, from the circulating human coronaviruses uh, in the nose. It look, you know, well, that, that has yet to be determined, but uh, we're hoping, uh, looking optimistic that we have a, an assay to do that. To quantitate the immune responses, the spike and the spike epitopes, um, because we want to get a correlate of protection. If we can get a correlate of protection um, from two different platforms uh, using these kind of harmonized licensure trials, and we actually have a correlate and we don't have to do 10 efficacy trials. We can bridge and get, um, and get, the, um, and, and get cross uh, efficacy data um, and hence move to manufacturing and distribution and get it into people's arms markedly quicker. Uh, and we obviously need to evaluate T cell responses, um, whether that's gonna be a correlate or not remains to be de determined. We could, um, uh, the other bubble there um, uh, was to have a common DSMB um, uh, and also to have a group of statisticians uh, to look at correlates for protection. Um, uh, so uh, we'd like to see the DSMBs be, um, be common. Um, <clears throat> we have essentially taken the HIV apparatus and, um, and moving it to, um, COVID disease, both in therapy and in uh, prevention. So taking the HIV, uh, the HPTN, the HPTN, the Infectious Disease Research Networks, to integrate them into what I'll call a COVID vaccine prevention network. Um, we wanna, we've drafted an integrated master protocol. We've taken the validated labs from the HPTN and switched them to COVID. Uh, so they can become centralized laboratories for support, just like um, uh, they have been for HIV vaccines. And we're supplementing that with some um, uh, uh, laboratories that are specialized in coronavirus. There's one that does a live virus neutralization assay, um, which has to be done in BL3 uh, at UNC. Next slide. Um, uh, <clears throat> if you look at the global network, um, uh, and we put these three together just from the US point of view, um, <clears throat> we have uh, pretty close to 48 sites uh, in the United States, we have around 30 sites in um, South America, and we have all uh, the sites that you're very familiar with, uh, over 50 sites in Sub-Saharan Africa, and a very large number of sites um, to, in, in South Africa. Um, <clears throat> we look at the platform technologies, um, uh, protein vaccines, RNA and DNA vaccines, the ad 26 vector uh, from Johnson & Johnson, and the VSV vector, the Ebola vector, uh, from Merck. These are um, the main five platform technologies um, that have been selected. Uh, A, they work, and B, they're scalable. Um, and um, so they have worked conceptually. Um, uh, 
26 in DSV for Ebola. RNA is, is new, and of course, most vaccines are protein based vaccines. Um, if we can, uh, I'm going to try and see if I can uh, show you this cute little animation. If it takes forever, uh, we're not going to do this. It's what a vaccine does. There's a host cell. Whoops. Okay. We went past it. It's fine. It's not, it's, it, this animation took some time. time so you guys can see antibodies bouncing off of, you make antibodies and it bounces off. So <clears throat> I made this chart to sort of look at why, why there needs to be multiple vaccines and sort of the advantages and disadvantages. So recombinant protein. So, you know, that's hepatitis B, flu, uh, HPV, almost all the stuff that we do in HIV. The disadvantage of the recombinant protein is, is that it needs an adjuvant, um, preferably a Th1 uh, adjuvant like ASO1B. It is more expensive to manufacture than an ad vector or RNA. You know, invariably, we'll have multiple doses. It won't be a one-dose vaccine. Hopefully, um, you know, two doses is um, sort of what we will do. Um, we can't, it's not going to work very well if we have to give three, four, or five doses. It will make antibodies in CD4 cells. It's tried and true. Um, its scalability is such that you can make hundreds of millions of doses um, at current yields, but not billions. But the problem actually is adjuvant availability. There's a worldwide squalene shortage, and that's the best adjuvant that we have um, <clears throat> for not there. It can be ASO13 or ASO3 or this or that, but most of the good adjuvants um, use squalene. Um, and so that's going to be a rate limiter for that. mRNA is sort of um, the the sort of the the vaccine du jour. Um, it, you can you know make an mRNA vaccine. It was actually I think made the first one was sort of made in vitro within you know two weeks or two and a half weeks of um, the sequence being um, uh, made in animal models and. Um, phase one clinical trials that can give long lasting antibody responses. You have to wrap it in a, in a um, lipid nanoparticle and that's, um, which is able to deliver the antigen uh, at multiple sites in the body for a long time, the liver, the lung. Um, it's also a potent adjuvant besides protecting the RNA, but yet it's unknown. It's not yet licensed for any vaccine. Uh, scale up manufacturing has never been done. We don't have any long-term safety or toxicity data. Um, what's the best RNA expression system is not yet known. It needs to be worked out in phase one and two. Um, a lot of data to show it gives CD4 T cell help in antibodies, um, but the, the scalability is, is an issue. Um, it's, it's pretty certain you can make hundreds of millions of doses, um, and you certainly can make a lot of RNA. <clears throat> Whether, again, there's enough LNP to do what needs to be done uh, remains to be seen. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> DNA, uh, especially uh, the HVTN, we have a long history of, of safety. Um, it's flexible, rapid manufacturing. Um, it, at the moment, the most potent thing is it needs electroporation. No one wants to use that electroporation machine, and if you have to have a device, it's not very practical. Um, <clears throat> there's no licensed vaccine yet in humans. Um, the, the, the reality is, is it, it again, DNA is that there's no major company involved in scale up of DNA. We know uh, in the HVTM, we've done a lot of prime boost with DNA and recombinant protein. That's a very effective combination making antibodies. But now you're talking about making both DNA and, and a protein. And again, becomes both more expensive uh, and the manufacturing issue is definitely an issue. Next slide. <clears throat> The last three slides are, are the, um, the three viral vectors, um, the non-replicating AD26 vector, widely used in Ebola, non-replicating, um, excellent antibody durability, um, may require two doses. Um, Pre-existing immunity to AD26 may affect the response more in South Africa than in, uh, in the U.S. It gives you a little, you know, a good uh, type of immune response. It has excellent scalability. Uh, J and J feels they can produce as much as a billion doses, um, and has uh, the potential for some long-term term durability. So, it looks pretty attractive in, in a lot of ways. 
The VSV vector in Ebola is a one-dose live viral vector, works very well, 90% efficacy in Ebola, uh, which again has the, the, the protein. Um, <clears throat> compared to non-replicating vectors, you use it at lower dose. It does have more side effects. Um, and, uh, you know, in Ebola, maybe you vaccinate a few hundred thousand people, maybe as much as a million people. We're talking way more people. Will we get more arthralgias, more side effects? Uh, concern for immunizing pregnant women. Gives you great innate immunity because it's a live viral vector. Um, but it still requires major scale-up. Um, Merck is the... Um, is the company it's capable of, of that kind of scale up, but <clears throat> again, what kind of scale up and what kind of side effect you would get from the VSV vector. The chimp ad vector has been in the, um, in the, in the news. Um, uh, again, very little known about it um, from an immunogenicity point of view. It's been used as a cancer vector. It has uh, some, some experience in infectious disease. Again, never been licensed, little safety data in the general population does seem to give you both CD8, CD4 responses. How good the antibody responses are gonna be is unclear. Um, <clears throat> and whether it, its antibody responses are gonna be as good as, as uh, the AD26 vector or the um, uh, remains, or even the VSV vectors remains to be determined. Next slide. Mm. As all the initial targets of these big five initial large pharma vaccine approaches uh, are to the spike protein, I think the ability to find a correlate is high if we use centralized laboratories and do these immune response antibody measures real time. And if two or more trials show a similar correlate, we can essentially define a surrogate marker of protection and it makes the subsequent vaccine development considerably easier. The correlate may not occur for all population groups, especially let's say the elderly. Um, I think, um, one of the areas that we need to be real serious about is that the monoclonal antibody may for some populations be, be better. We can't assume that um, the elderly population um, uh, will react the same as the young adult population. Now, as far as doing trials, um, uh, I, I just sort of go through this quickly. I think I'm going over a little bit. Um, uh, I'll just say, say the endpoints for a vaccine trial are acquisition, infection, uh, severity of disease, and decreasing transmission. Uh, next slide. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to just basically say if we can prevent infection, that's great. If we can ameliorate disease, um, that's going to be good. Um, it's easier to find in acquisition than, than mm -hmm. disease, but it can be done. And we will do it. Um, let's go to the next slide. I'm going to want to get to the end of this so we can do the panel. How uh, we define the frequency and severity of disease is an issue, but this is all possible. Um, uh, it's not proven ground. We have to. We, we will have to, you know, pioneer a, 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 an issue of what are the disease manifestations that um, we'll look at. Um, how will, will vaccine reduce PCR negativity? Will you get people back to work sooner? Will you decrease the time in quarantine? All these are issues that <clears throat> we will have to define as we move to, to this aspect of doing uh, clinical trials. Uh, we are putting um, a protocol in to follow COVID positive people and look at their immune responses and try and get some natural history data of people with recently uh, outpatient disease because that's what we would expect most will happen. Um, <clears throat> we're not going to see a, a huge incidence of hospitalization uh, with the kinds of, of, of trials that we're going to look, look at. Next slide. Mm, I'll just sort of talk through this and say that we think modeling the epidemic approximately a 4% annual incidence or 2% uh, six-month incidence. We're looking at shorter term. Try again and answer it that the trials will be between eight and 10,000 per trial. Next slide. Um, the target populations, you guys know this. Let's go, go through the next slide. Um, <clears throat> and I'll just sort of say that the infrastructure that we've built in HIV will be the center of stage, I think, for the COVID-19 vaccine and monoclonal antibody prevention studies. I'll just say this movie will be coming to your neighborhood very soon. Um, we do plan on uh, wanting to use the global network. Um, part of the reason to doing this is to 
get everybody thinking about what clinical infrastructure do you need to do a vaccine study? <clears throat> um, how do you follow, identify, but then subsequently follow COVID positive endpoints and look at the disease severity in an intense way? Um, uh, and um, how, how would we sort of develop the infrastructure to do the kind of vaccine trials that, you know, are very similar to what we did in HIV, do in HIV, um, uh, but look at disease severity. Next slide. So the monoclonals are also coming about the same time. Um, Mike Cohn and Mary Maravich are sort of leading uh, a lot of this on this topic. And the next slide is a bunch of thank yous to the HVTN Executive Committee, Mike Cohn, who I spent an enormous amount of time with, uh, our lab, um, the VRC, John Mascola, Barney Graham, um, Dave, the people who uh, fund us and the incredible support that we get. Um, from America's doctor, Tony Fauci, you see on television every day, and Francis Collins, uh, who's been involved in developing these public-private partnerships. So, um, thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Larry. Really appreciate uh, that magnificent overview of this topic and giving us such a clear outline of the mm. scientific steps uh, that are required to get us out of this situation. So. Uh, I just want to move straight over to the panel discussion and the way we've set it up is, is we've invited uh, three colleagues from UCT to ask one or two questions and, and to go around. So first I'd, I'd like to start with Carolyn Williamson who's the head of uh, virology at UCT and Carolyn if, if you want to come in if there's if there's any comment or, or questions that you want to pose to, to Larry. Um, thanks. thanks Larry, that was great. So I wanted to explore um, a little bit more about evidence of reinfection so you mentioned that in other coronaviruses that there isn't long-lived immunity and that it wanes over two years. Um, and then some 20 or 30 years ago, there were challenge models where there was no protection. So is there any evidence of reinfection in, um, with uh, SARS-CoV-2 and all alternatively evidence that the type of immune response is different maybe in magnitude of kinetics compared to other coronaviruses? To my knowledge at this point in time, the answer is, is we don't know. Um, I, you know, I, I just would have to say that, uh, you know, you do see anecdotal cases of people with, with persistent shedding. Is it RNA? Is it Memorex? Or is it live virus? Are they getting reinfected um, and having asymptomatic acquisition from reinfection? Um, I, th I think at this point in time, we don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, and we may see an anecdote here, uh, two or three or four, um, you know, we do know reinfection occurs in HIV, but yet we don't think it's yet common. So how that really will affect how, you know, the effectiveness of the vaccine or not, you know, I, I do think this disease is really different than a human coronavirus, but yet that doesn't mean that the outcome of immunity won't be the same. So I, I you know, th these are good questions that we're just going to have to answer. And then you could also say, you know, even if reinfection occurs, if it's like RSV or, or, or some other respiratory diseases and you, you, you have an anamnestic response and you abort that so you don't become hospitalized and you don't, make, you know, and you don't uh, get into the ICU, then we've done our job. Um, now, if you get an immune enhancement, that, that, that's, that's difficult. But you know, generally with natural infection, that, that hasn't occurred. So I'll ask another question later if there's time, Graham. Okay, thanks, Karen. So, so to go on to uh, Tom Scriba, Tom's an immunologist at the, and uh, Deputy Director of the South African TB Vaccine. Hi, Larry, thanks very much. Um, I guess I can follow up from Karen's question. Um, what do we know about cross-reactivity with immunity-induced or lasting from seasonal coronavirus? Do you think that that could be an issue or or potentially may that be a reason why younger people who might be more frequently infected may actually to some degree have some protection? Well, those are good questions. Um, I'll only say that when I talk to like bona fide coronavirus virologists, uh, I'm not one of them, um, um, Ralph Barrick and a couple others, they don't think much that of that cross reactivity of human coronaviruses are going to be at all protective and in challenge models. They've, 
done done some of some of that. Um, they do throw out the issue that they might interfere with this, the ability to serologically distinguish um, SARS-CoV-2 from the circulating strain of human coronavirus, which sort of, at least in the U.S., varies each year between one of the one of those ones with the numbers that um, HKU1, the, the Hong Kong one, or the uh, OC. 299E or something, um, or occasionally NL63. Um, and that's something that we're working on um, with um, blocking antibody assays and other kinds of things to see if it uh, does the laboratory thing. Um, but, um, you know, that I would say from the issue of why children are not, you know, are they infected subclinically? Um, uh, are they not infected? Um, and is that due to an adaptive immune response or an innate immune response or some um, differential expression of the receptor in the nose? I think is a really great mystery and, and um, I think is something that should be looked at. I would say that in an early look in Seattle of the, of the CIRA from a thousand kids at the Children's Hospital in Seattle in the last month, um, there are no SARS-2 COVID-2 antibodies. Um, it's, you know, they're, they're like 30 kids who are right at the borderline. And so we're looking at them in, in another way, but uh, you know, it doesn't even look like they're, that they have an, a, that they're getting infected rather than they're just subclinically infected and don't get disease. And that is um, strange. Now there are, there are kids in the hospital, so it's not, not an all, of, all or none phenomenon. But the the lack of um, uh, of children, even out of out of China, uh, at least you know certainly they reported a large case series of two thousand kids, but you know that was two thousand and had a million adults. So it's it, it is a mystery. And if you guys have any insight, uh, I'd like to hear about it. Great, thanks. Thanks, Tom. So, and then our, our third panel member is, is Linda Gale Becker. Linda Gale is the uh, Deputy Director of the Desmond Tutu HIV Center and has done wide experience with HIV vaccine trials. So, Linda Gale. Thanks, Graham, and I know time's out, but thanks, Larry. That was terrific. Um, also, thanks to Andrew. Always lovely to get the update weekly. Appreciate it. So, Larry, my question is, one of the things that has fraught um, flu vaccination to date has been the lack of protection that we see in the elderly. Um, just a little more reflection on what you think, hypothesize, predict, speculate might happen in the, in the context of COVID-19, recognizing that the elderly population is particularly the population that we want to protect in this disease. What, what are some of your sort of deeper thoughts about that? Um, monoclonal antibodies are my deepest thought. Um, and, and, um, I'm very worried too, <laughs> you know, right here, I fall, both Tony and I fall in that classification <laughs> and we both yeah, say, Hey, we're, you know, <laughs> Larry, don't forget the monoclonals. <laughs> he tells me, we both talk to each other about that. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I am worried about it. Okay. You know, I, I think that, um, protein vaccines, um, you know, you know, the immune response is going to be lousy. Um, uh, I mean, maybe with the adjuvant VSV has, has done well. Um, what RNA is going to do uh, is anybody's guess. Um, and there's no experience with ad 26. Um, uh, and so, um, uh, and is the toxicity of the VSV vector going to be such that, um, you know, the ambulatory or the non-ambulatory elderly will not want that vaccine? Um, so I do think that it's an issue, um, and I do think uh, long-acting monoclonal antibodies could be attractive um, uh, for short-term prophylaxis or maybe to get you through the epidemic and then see, um, you know, you know, use a higher dose of a protein or an adjuvant to, to get more, you know, prolonged um, uh, immunity over time so you, you have durability out of this. So. I do think it's an issue, and I think that's one of the reasons um, getting the mentality to understand we need multiple vaccines 
This is not something that we are gonna say, gee, we want a single HPV vaccine or a single hepatitis B vaccine. That's basically the same vaccine. We need multiple vaccines. Larry, can I just ask you, to, uh, I know the talk wasn't on the monoclonals, but that platform, how scalable is that? Uh, and you know, how, how in terms of globally uh, providing a prevention in, in, in high risk groups? I guess, Graham, it's sort of, it's like when there's a will, there's a way. You know, they, they um, are able to make antibodies uh, at, you know, very large scale now. Um, yes, is it going to be more expensive than a vaccine? And, and do I think it's sort of, and, and yes, is it being made mainly for therapy? I mean, the, you know, if you ask the companies that are involved with this, they're big companies, uh, AstraZeneca, Lilly, Regeneron, um, that, you know, they're in it at first for therapy, um, the, the Don, the monstrable uh, effective uh, monoclonal affecting therapy is Ebola. This, this disease is a biphasic disease that lasts a reasonable time. So maybe if you give it earlier, you, you will be able to do that um, and, um, <clears throat> and, and modify disease. Um, should it work in prevention? Um, uh, yes, we would think, relax the receptor. Um, how scalable will it be? Um, I don't see it as a four, you know, a billion scalable, but, um, but can it be for elderly and selected populations? Can you make hundreds of millions of, of doses of something that, that you would give every four months? Um, yes, I think that's, that there is a, there is a sweet spot is, you know, obviously for, you know, no antibody lasts more than four or eight months. So, uh, you know, it's a real problem if we have to, co you know, it's not going to cover the global issue. Okay. It's not going to cover the young adult issue, the getting everybody back to work. Uh, for sure, we need a vaccine and we need something that's long acting and preferably um, something that's one dose. But if we have to give two doses and get it all over within a month and it lasts for a long period of time, we're all going to be fine. And, um, you know, and, and maybe even if it's not that durable, you'll have enough memory from the vaccination so that if you get reinfected, um, you'll have a, an abortive disease and you won't have, end up in the ICU, which is sort of what this is all about. We won't end up dying. We're not going to show that in the first trials, but with continued long-term follow-up, you're going to see licensure before you see, you know, we're not designing any of these studies to prevent hospitalization. I mean, then the studies with each vaccine would be like 30,000, mm -hmm. um, 40,000. And, and, you know, it, it, you know, you're going to have to take some risks here um, with respect to starting to say what's good enough in a, in a trial to then start this concept of vaccinating the world. Mm -hmm. Does, Carolyn, did, did you have one last question? Uh, Okay. Yeah, I wanted to ask a quick question actually about the extraordinary high viral load titers. Um, I mean, you showed CT values, but that translates into titers of, I believe, like 10 to the 8 viruses or something, which is, ex is, is extremely high. And what the comparison was between symptomatics and asymptomatics, um, because obviously we're all very worried about the asymptomatic transmission and if there's a correlation there. Well, I, we don't have that data because, you know, this is just all the stuff that's going, coming into the lab. Um, most of it would be symptomatic people um, because that's the criteria, um, at least in the United States uh, for the first, you know, even up to today, you know, testing was, a, quote, a precious commodity. So uh, if you were mildly symptomatic, you were often told just don't bother showing up or you didn't fit the CDC criteria. Um, so there's a skewing as to who gets cultured when you have this. Almost all of it is symptomatic. You know, a lot of data, you know, in the animal models uh, show that, you know, day after, you know, inoculation before they develop fever, et cetera, is the highest rate. And in some people, you know, on the cruise ships and other kinds of things, um, the highest titers have been in the pre pre You know, they're just starting to feel, you know, they, they're called asymptomatic, but if you ask them, they're really not quite, they're mildly symptomatic. And that has tended to be, you know, the upswing curves that you see. So I think most of the models suggest that's the most infectious state. And that's what makes this sort of dangerous. And maybe you can then look at a vaccine that just aborts that and gets that below, you know, what, what threshold is major transmission. Again, no one really knows. Okay. So um, 
We've come to the end of the hour and just gone a little bit over. So once again, thank you to Andrew and thanks, thanks, uh, Larry. Those were two great inputs and, and really uh, we've had a fantastic webinar this afternoon. Um, Larry, uh, we, we're holding thumbs that uh, we, you can get us to a vaccine uh, <laughs> uh, with with the HVTN and, and colleagues very quickly because uh, we really do need a, a way out of this situation that we're in. So uh, thanks very much and thanks for the work that you're doing. Okay. Won't be for a lack of trying. Okay, thank you. And, and uh, we'll uh, send out the advert for the next webinar um, uh, later this week. Thanks very All much. Right. Thank you.